The conversion of Umar had a tremendous effect upon them and after he had become a Muslim the Muslims started to be a little bit more courageous in talking but still the Quraysh they doubled the stress and the uh, persecution upon the Muslims after that. So what did they do? They went to Abu Talib and they said to him, listen man, we've had enough. This is the last straw. If you do not hand over your nephew and we'll give you blood money or the entire of Quraysh is going to boycott you. They're going to boycott you and the entire Banu Hashim and Abdul Manaf. We're going to boycott the entire people who are related to Muhammad وسلم, from his father's side. No one's going to marry from you. No one's going to trade with you. No one's going to eat from your food. No one's going to socialize with you. You're going to be completely boycotted. This has never happened in the Arab world. And Abu Talib said to them, do whatever you want. Boycott everything. I will not stop protecting my nephew. And Abu Talib himself said, no, 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 actually I volunteer to leave. He took all of Banu Hashim and they left Mecca and they went outside and took a little valley which they called Sha'bat Abu Talib. And they sat, subhanAllah, being boycotted, my brothers and sisters, for the next two to three years. And in fact, Abu Jahl and the rest of the chiefs got together and they wrote a deal, a pact between them. In that deal they said, no one will deal, interact, socialize, trade with, marry from, in any shape, way or form, with Banu Hashim and all the allies, anyone who supports Muhammad All of them signed to it, they sealed it, and they wrote on top, Bismik Allahum, in your name, O Allah. Because they believed in Allah, but they made partners with Him. And they put it inside of the Kaaba, locked it up, and no one was allowed to go against it. For the next two to three years, the Muslims suffered the most suffering along with them were their cousins and relatives. They said, we used to eat leaves and shrubs like the way goats and camels ate. And we used to survive on whatever water from the rain that came down to us. Some of us attracted diseases, and some of us died from hunger. And <coughs> Glam Abbas says that when we went to relieve ourselves, to defecate, our defecation was like that of what you see in goats and sheep. We were sick for two to three years and we survived on food that someone had secretly brought to us. As time passed, there were groups of, of men that were related to the Prophet وسلم, or related to Abu Talib or related to them from their mother's side. One of them was Hakim ibn Hizam and uh, Mut'am ibn Adi. They were non-Muslims at the time, but they were good people. Prophet ﷺ, being boycotted, he made dua against them that time. And Allah sent a famine. He said, Oh Allah, bring upon them the famine like the famine of Yusuf. ﷺ. And that influenced a lot of the non Muslims who had some sympathy for the Muslims. This man, Mut'im ibn Adi, and Hakim ibn Hizam, along with a few other men, they went to Abu Jahl and the other leaders in Darul Nadwa. And they insisted to stop the boycott because it was unfair, it was unjust. And they plotted a plan to go against it. Abu Jahl said to them, you all signed to that paper that we put inside the Kaaba, that you will all boycott Muhammad and his family and the rest of them. And then the first man said, I didn't. Then he said, what are you talking about? The second man said, I didn't, I was forced to. The third man said, I didn't. And this was a, really a plot. So Abu Jahl said, Wallahi, this is a plot that you guys have made just to get a campaign against me. To lobby against me. They stopped the boycott. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to Abu Talib, his uncle, tell them to check that paper they signed that's inside of the Kaaba the worm or the uh, termite has eaten from it except for the word Bismillah. They went inside and Wallahi before their eyes only that word was left. And that was one of the miracles that also affected a lot of them. It started from approximately the sixth year and ended in the ninth year. At the end of the ninth year for about three years. Some scholars say two and a half years. It was one of the worst things that had yet happened to the Prophet ﷺ and his 
people who are supporting him, his family, they're not supporting him because of his religion, they're supporting him because of their honor and pride that he is part of their family. And as we said, this was the culture of the Arabs. My brothers and sisters in Islam, that was the boycott. And when the boycott was released, just as they received the relief, the Prophet ﷺ's uncle, who was protecting him for this past 10 years, died. And now that his uncle is gone, that's it. His own tribe is against the Prophet ﷺ. Now there is no one to protect the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib, as a result of the boycott and his old age, and the Prophet ﷺ was extremely filled with anxiety. He loved his uncle. And because of his love for his uncle, he loved for Iman to be inside of him so that he can live with his uncle in Jannah. But now he knows that his uncle is going to die a disbeliever. So when Abu Talib reached the deathbed, Rasulullah ﷺ was anxious to make him just say the Shahada. Abu Talib, wallahi, he believed in the Prophet's message. He knew that the Quran was the truth. He invited people to believe in the Prophet ﷺ. He said, follow him, he will lead you to truth. He protected him, he supported him, but his intention was not for Allah. It was for his lineage and his pride. The Prophet ﷺ said to his uncle, Say, La ilaha illallah, my uncle, just whisper it in my ear and I will bear witness on the day of judgment that you said it. Just whisper it, whisper it. That's all. Don't have to pray, don't have to fast, don't do anything else. Just sit in your bed, wait to die and just whisper it in my ear, my uncle. Rasulullah from his love for him, he wanted him to be guided. Abu Talib opened his mouth. He was about to say it. Then Abu Jahl and the Walid ibn Mughira entered. Are you going against your father, Abdul Muttalib? Are you better than him? And then he closed his mouth. And he said, on the religion of my forefathers. The Prophet ﷺ then left. He wanted to see him again while he was crying for him. Then his cousin Ali radiallahu anhu, the son of Abu, Mut of Abu Talib, came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, he said something that sounds bad, but he was out of pain and hurt. He said, your lost uncle has died. His own father. So the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on the shoulder of Ali and he said to him, go and wash your father, shroud him and bury him, and then come back. So he goes and shrouded him with his own hands. Ali he buried him with his own hands. And he came back. And the Prophet ﷺ, he counseled Ali anhu until Ali anhu calmed down. So Abu Lahab, remember the uncle of the Prophet, Abu Lahab? He was second in line up after Abu Talib. He felt sorry for Muhammad. ﷺ, so he comes up to him, Abu Lahab, and he says, Nephew, you're still protected by me. I come after my brother Abu Talib continue doing what you were doing as my brother let you. He felt remorse. But Abu Jahl came to Abu Lahab and said to him, why don't you go and ask him where your father Abdul Muttalib ended up? So he goes and asks him, my nephew, where is my father Abdul Muttalib? And the Prophet ﷺ was very wise to choose his words. He didn't lie, but he didn't give him the answer he wanted. He said, he is with his people. So he goes back happy to Abu Jahl and says, my nephew said he's with his people. And Abu Jahl said, you idiot, where are his people, you idiot, stupid man? So Abu Lahab, he got angry and he said, I'm not going to protect my nephew. And so the protection was released. Forty days later, on the tenth day of Ramadan, his loyal and protecting wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, also died. And that was even more painful to the heart of the Blessed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That year was so bad that they called it, and we know it till today as Aam al Huzun, the year of sorrow. And the Sahaba said, we never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sadder than the day when his wife Khadija radiallahu anha died. For Wallahi, for the next months, up to six months, the Prophet ﷺ barely spoke a word for the loss of his beloved wife. And he used to say, narrated in Sahih Muslim, 
God Almighty never granted me anyone better in this life than her. She accepted me when people rejected me. She believed in me when people doubted me. She shared her wealth with me when people deprived me. And Allah granted me children only through her. So he doesn't have a wife. His children were all married. They were girls. The Prophet's home is at risk. They can attack at any time. His wealth, they can take at any time. So he was at risk in every shape and form. When he found himself unable to live in his own hometown, Mecca, he stayed to the last minute, 10 years, doing everything he can not to leave. He could have gone to Abyssinia, but why didn't he? Because the Prophet's heart is connected to his home. But when he saw that his life was at risk, he painstakingly had to think of another place to go to just to be protected. So he looked for the closest place to Mecca. So the closest place was a place called al -Taif. So he thought, maybe I can go there and these people will welcome me or at least give me some safe haven. In there, there was a tribe called Banu Thaqif. This tribe, Banu Thaqif, was very close in pride and importance as the people of Mecca, as, as Quraysh. And they had a god which they worshipped, their ultimate god was called Alat. When he reached there, he had sent news with uh, someone to meet with three particular brothers. They were chieftains of that place. And they agreed to meet him. So when he got there, he met with them. And he spoke to them about his mission as a prophet. He gave them a little bit of da'wah, not too much. And told them, you're free to accept or refuse. What did they do? They had heard about his situation. And instead of welcoming him, they were the most vile and bitter to the Prophet ﷺ. This is all in the same year of his sorrow. Calamities upon calamities. They said that foul words to him. The first one said, Well, if you're a messenger of God, I might as well rip the curtains of the Kaaba off it. Sarcastically, he says, I don't have any belief in it. I won't accept you. The second one says, Out of all people, couldn't Allah choose anyone else but you? The third one said, If you are a, truly a prophet, then you are too holy for me to talk to you. And if you are not a prophet, then... My dignity is too high than for you to talk to me. Just sarcastic, stupid words. So the best thing he said to them was, Look, if you're not going to accept, then I ask you for one thing. Please do not tell Quraysh that I came here. And they respected that. And truly, they didn't tell Quraysh that he had gone there. Who was he there with? He took only one man with him. His then adopted son, Zayd ibn Harith. Radiallahu anhu. And he chose to walk there. He did not choose to go on a horse or a camel. He gave some da'wah to the people in the market. It seemed like some people were accepting Islam, but the majority of them weren't. Especially the chieftains. They wanted to stop this. And so they got scared, and they wanted to cause a big problem for the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, they didn't tell Quraysh, but they went into the city, and they started to round up thugs and children, women, men, all these people who like to make trouble. They convinced the children to come up, and the women... And those thuggish men, all with rocks. They trapped the Prophet ﷺ and Zayd. Zayd radiallahu tried to protect the Prophet ﷺ, but he was smashed everywhere. And the Prophet ﷺ's blood seeped from all parts of his body until it reached his toes. So far, a boycott. Uncle dies. Wife dies. No home. No money. No family. Nowhere to go. Only the clothes he is wearing. No mount, no horse, no camel. Nothing, no food. And his life is at risk. No protection. But Zayd radiallahu anhu, because he was there, he spoke a bit more detail about it. So he, he told us. He said, after that incident of throwing the rocks, we tried to run away from there. So we saw... 
a little land that had the, a wall around it. It belonged to someone. And in those days, if you enter someone's property, you are protected. No one can touch you unless the owner of the property wants to give you it. But he also has to protect you. So it's temporary protection. He said, we sat with our backs on the wall of that garden. It had grapes in it and it had other fruits in it. And we didn't know that it belonged to one of the two chiefs of Makkah, of Quraysh themselves, Utba and Shaiba, his brother. Utba is the father of Hind and Shaiba her uncle. That was a big deal, man. He didn't want Quraysh to know, but that was his land. And Utba had happened to be there looking after his land. The Meccans used to grow crops and, and fruit and vegetation over there in al -Tariq. Fortunate for the Prophet ﷺ, Utba and Shaiba, what happened to them? They felt bad for the Prophet ﷺ actually. And Utba, to be honest with you, is normally a good man by nature. But the pride of tribalism took over. So this man Utba and Shaiba thought, man, Muhammad ﷺ, he's one of us. We can't leave him to these people who are our rivals. To mistreat him, it's, 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 it's embarrassing, it's shame on us. They gave him protection temporarily in the great one, Yah. And they had a slave by the name of Adas. This man, Adas, was a Christian, a proper Christian. And he came from Iraq. There is a city there called Ninawa. Nobody knows the Christian belief in al Ta'if and Makkah. They, they don't know it. So Adas, he's there and his master, Utba, says to him, take this plate of grapes to Muhammad. Just before he took the grapes, there is a famous dua that the Prophet ﷺ made just after they had done that terrible thing to him. He's hit rock bottom. And he's a human himself, ﷺ. So we sat at that wall and Zayd Radilano says, I heard the Prophet ﷺ lift his arms up and make the following dua. He said, Oh Allah, who have you left me to? To a stranger who ridicules me or to a family member who's supposed to be my support but instead he controls my life now, my life and death. And then he said, Oh Allah, if you're not angry with me, then it doesn't matter. All of this, I'll forget about it. I don't, I don't care. It's as if the Prophet ﷺ is saying, like what a normal human would say, Ya Allah, I don't understand. Are you angry with me? Have I done something? What have I done? Ya Allah. He's pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's, he's, he's crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have I done anything to hurt you? Have I done anything to anger you? Yeah. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, You have the right, my Lord, to reprimand me and say anything you want until you are pleased. I will accept it so long as at the end of the... You are pleased with me. I just want your pleasure. I just want your pleasure. But your ease for me is more beloved to me. And then in the end, the Prophet ﷺ said, and in the end, there is no power or might except with you, O Allah. As soon as he finished this dua, Adas comes along with a plate of grapes. It's not Adas. It's not Utba, it's not Shaiba, it's none of these people. Who is the one that's bringing him the plate of grapes? He's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adas gives him the, the grape, and the Prophet sallallahu puts his hands out and says, Bismillah. Adas looks at him and says, What are those words? I've never heard them before. He says, It's in the name of Allah, my Lord and Lord. And the Prophet sallallahu asked him, Where are you from? He said, I'm from Ninawa. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Yunus ibn Matta, the Prophet Jonah, son of Matta. Adas looks at him with open eyes. He's about to cry. And he says, Who taught you this name? How do you know this name? And how do you know he's from there? The Prophet ﷺ replied by saying, He is my brother, a prophet, and I am a messenger of Allah. Immediately he fell to the Prophet's knees and began, legs and began to kiss them. Shaiba, 
looks at his brother Utba and says, look, <laughs> you sent your slave to look after him. And instead, he put magic on him. He's converted him. We're like, bring him back. He goes and drags Abdas away. And he says, what are you doing, man? Your religion is better than his. He goes, Wallahi, he is a messenger of God. No one knows this knowledge except the messenger of God. Immediate response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he's strengthening the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's strengthening him. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got up and left with Zayd when everybody else dispersed. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I walked and walked until I didn't know where I had ended up. Suddenly I found myself in such a place. And that shows us that the Prophet ﷺ was actually in trauma. He says, I wanted, then I rested and I looked up above me and I saw a cloud. And on that cloud I saw Jibreel ﷺ. And he said to me, Allah heard your dua and he has sent me with the angel of the mountains. If you want, he will do anything you please for what the people of Ta'if did to you. He said, then I heard the voice, another voice of the angel of the mountains saying, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has sent me to you. Whatever you wish, I will do. If you want me to crush them between the two mountains, because that's where they were, I will do so right now. And there'll be no more Ta'if. It'll become extinct. What did the Prophet ﷺ reply? He said, no. If they don't embrace, they don't, they don't save themselves, then maybe Allah will bring from them children later on who will worship Allah alone with no partners. As he was sitting there, night, night fell. Zayd al-Ghan went to sleep. The Prophet ﷺ got up to pray to Hajjud. As he is praying to Hajjud, something miraculous happens. Something that looked like dark fog started to come near the Prophet ﷺ. I got up and the Prophet did this with his hand. Stay where you are. Dark fog encompassed the Prophet ﷺ. And after the Prophet ﷺ finished his salah, the fog went away. Allah revealed this in the Qur'an. In Surah Al-Jinn. They were a group of jinns. They happened to be passing by there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them pass by there. And they said, Shh, listen. As the Prophet was reciting Quran, they said, Shh, behold, when we made a group of jinns go past your way. And when they heard the Quran, they said to each other, Be quiet, listen. What is this? They heard the Quran and they were intrigued by it. They went back to their people. Oh, our people, we have heard words that have never been before. It talks about Moses and like the message of Moses. And they said that he is talking about stuff that Moses used to speak about and it confirms it. And then they started to preach to their people, to their jinns, to follow this messenger. Not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieve and show the Prophet the comfort of jinns, and not only did they believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi but they also went to become messengers from the messenger sallallahu alayhi to their people. Now the jinns are being called to Islam and saved from the fire. Allahu Akbar. Then, he said, we arrived back in Mecca. And Zayd radiallahu he says, he's got no protection. So before we entered Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ tried his best to seek refuge with someone. He, he sent a message to a few of the chiefs, asking them to give him protection. They rejected him. But finally, there was one of the chiefs, his name was Mut'im ibn Adi. He was the only one that offered or accepted to give the Prophet ﷺ protection including his family. So he said to him, come to the Kaaba. He came and met him there and he said, you do your tawaf and come and talk to me. So the Prophet ﷺ did tawaf and Mut'im said to his sons, take your weapons, put them there and cover them. 
If you cover your weapons, it means that you're not there to fight, but you're there to protect. And go around with him. If anyone attacks him, defend him. Who came along? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is one of the main chiefs. And he asked Butaim, Have you converted? Or are you protecting? He said, No, I have not converted. I'm protecting. So then Abu Sufyan said to him, We protect him you have protected. Meaning, we won't harm. So the Prophet ﷺ was protected for a further approximately two years before he died. Mutam ibn Adi died. So the Prophet ﷺ honored him. Till today, Mutam ibn Adi is honored for this. And the protection was gone after close to two years. During that time, the Prophet ﷺ was taken on the journey of Isra and Miraj.